Could you tell me, was there anything that kind of sparked at that fire, that passion in you that made you decide that you wanted to focus your, your, your career and your life to uh, the Middle East? I guess I was both intrigued by the politics. While in school I was, I was studying art, I saw you know, beautiful uh, Islamic art and architecture and I was interested in how those two things came together, what the history was, what the society was really like. We are going to see attempts at migration continue and I think that's a reality of our world that we have to deal with a bit better. There's no easy answer to this. To improve things in a genuine way for the long term, not just papering over the cracks because that won't work. Should we be talking about conflict in a different way and taking in this, this really important factor of like, you know, the, the fundamental building block of life, which is water? This is a shared resource that is extremely valuable. It's, it's, it's essentially more valuable than oil. It can also spill across borders. If countries blame the country next door for the water shortage, and you've seen that between Iran and Afghanistan lately. And yet these rivers or these or shared aquifers, they represent a really important opportunity for collaboration. Hi, I'm Chris Caldwell, and welcome to season three of Conversations on Climate. Gleda, thank you so much for inviting us into uh, Chatham House here and you know, have, giving us the honour of coming into this very storied library. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so your career has been, um, if I may say, seems to be laser focused. Uh, so from a very young age, you decided to um, study the Middle East. Um, and 20 years later, you're still here in uh, Chatham House looking at the same, the same issues and the same, uh, same problems. Could you tell me, was there anything that kind of sparked at that fire, that passion in you that made you decide that you wanted to focus your, your, your career and your life to uh, the Middle East? Well, I, it's funny that you say it's been linear because I suppose I don't think of it like that. I've done so many different kinds of jobs from working in bars and restaurants and parks to production, factory production line. Um, but you're right, I did have an early passion for the Middle East region. Um, I guess I was both intrigued by the politics. I mean, at the time we saw war, we saw terrorism on the television when I was growing up. Um, while in school I was, I was studying art, I saw you know, beautiful uh, Islamic art and architecture and I was interested in how those two things came together, what the history was, what, um, you know, what the society was really like. Uh, and so I took um, two years out actually after my A-levels and I, I travelled a bit in the region. Um, I worked in Israel, Palestine. Um, and uh, made a lot of friends and, and learned a lot uh, and, and uh, then applied to study Arabic. So I started off through a linguistic route, actually linguistic and cultural, but I also did international politics while I was, um, while I was learning Arabic. Uh, there was a year in Syria as well, in Damascus. And so when I came to uh, look for a job, I initially worked uh, on the Middle East, but increasingly I looked at oil and gas, given that it's a, it's a large producing region, and, um, and ended up as a research assistant here at Chatham House through a, uh, several serendipitous events. And, um, and I've been here for 20 years, but I was, not, I was never in the Middle East program. I actually worked in the, uh, well, what's now called the Environment and Society Center. And so I've really focused on oil and gas, energy, climate issues, uh, but tended to work across the uh, Middle East, North Africa and, and Sub-Saharan African regions. Was there a particular moment or a particular tipping point that uh, really fired your interest in the climate issues? So when I first came to Chatham House in 2004, I was actually um, working as a research assistant on a book on national oil companies in the Middle East, uh, written by a colleague, and I was helping her with some of the research. And I noticed that within the program, which was quite small at the time, uh, that there were people who worked on oil and gas, 
there were people who worked on climate change and there were people who worked on the forests and I think uh, energy and they didn't necessarily talk to each other. In fact, I realized very fast once I attended some of the meetings on climate change that there were the people there were speaking in a, in a very different language, um, looking much more long term, using quite normative language, you know, we must do this, we must achieve these targets. Whereas the oil and gas um, crowd, uh, we worked particularly on, on governance of the, of the oil and gas sector in, in developing countries, uh, was very much about um, you know, prices in the next few months. Uh, it was about st maintaining stability, stabilizing economies, um, how you how you create a sovereign wealth fund and optimize, you know, optimize the production of, of, of oil and gas for your for your economy and your development. So there were two very different dialogues, and I I thought, well, you're not going to be able to solve one without the other, right? I mean, even today, 82% of our traded energy comes from oil, coal and gas, you know, oil and gas itself is about 57% of that. Uh, we haven't really managed to make a dent in that. And it's never going to happen if you don't um, dial down um, the, the drivers of that consumption, but also address, uh, you know, the very real needs that producers have who are dependent on, on exporting those fuels. So, so over the years, actually, I worked on trying to bring those two communities together uh, through, first of all, a series of dialogues uh, called the Fossil Fuels Expert Roundtable. We had, um, I did uh, a large amount of work with, on energy policy in the Gulf countries. Um, and through all this, and also getting involved in some of the climate work, uh, I became really interested in what sort of impact climate change itself is gonna have on economies, on stability, um, because climate change itself was starting to make its effects felt um, during that time, including in the region. So clearly your work has made a big impact on the, you know, the building that we're sitting in, because in, in 2020, uh, while uh, Chatham House is celebrating its centenary, it came out with its second century um, you know, principles, and one of those at the very core of it was sustainability. So um, what does that the bringing in of sustainability into the the DNA of now of Chatham House. What does that tell you about the evolution of the of the of the, the building yeah. <laughs> over time? So Chatham House has always been a place for dialogue. It originated out of um, the anxieties, uh, the end of World War One, um, and uh, in in that sense, uh, there's always been room for dialogue between, for instance, producing and consuming countries, oil and, oil and gas uh, producers and consumers. Uh, that was at its height during the 1970s when we had the, the two oil price shocks. Uh, in the 1980s, climate change really came onto the agenda for, for the House and uh, we began holding an annual climate change conference. Um, and yes, many of my predecessors worked on uh, the Kyoto Protocol um, and were very involved in the negotiations. So there's that history there. Uh, but of course, what sustainability has evolved as a term. It's grown much bigger and you've seen that reflected in the programme that I work in, the Environment and Society Centre, which has grown. And Chatham House has uh, been involved in, like group deeply involved in the formation of some of the, you know, the global government institutions like United Nations, the IMF, and continuous, uh, continues to, to collaborate and play a, a leading role in the kind of the rules-based order that we have been operating under for, 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 for many years now. Um, a lot of people, myself included, have been, been kind of questioning whether you know, the, the current rules-based order is going to survive the, the current um, situation. Like we're in a, we're in a, a very, delicate moment in time where rule-based order is feeling an awful lot of pressure. Um, what, what's your take on the, you know, on the status of rules-based um, system that we're in? So we're seeing a problem with institutions that were set up uh, mainly in a, in a particular moment coming after uh, the Second World War um, and they reflected a world order that we had at that time. They reflected um, the aims and objectives of a particular time um, in, in building stability and, and reconstruction and economic growth. There have been immense changes in the world 
um, we now find we are still um, we are still stuck in a system that not only doesn't reflect uh, the power realities, but also um, is not helping us solve some of the major challenges that we have, whether that is in you know, ending conflict and, or ending poverty or um, addressing climate change. I mean, climate change, if we look at um, the uh, UN framework, conventional climate change, um, that's been around now for 32 years. It's an amazing architecture and it's something that still br brings the world together year on year, but it has not made progress in anywhere near as rapid a way as is needed um, in, in terms of the science, in terms of what we are seeing on the ground. And so there are some real um, reforms needed there. Also on the finance side, you know, we still have finance system that is based on um, perpetuating indebtedness. Um, and that really, you know, coming back to the issue of fossil fuels, that really encourages indebted countries to extract and sell more of their raw materials to enable them to pay back loans and interest. Um, but also to raise their credit rating, which is essential for investment in things like renewables. Um, we have a moment of, of intense distrust, I think, in the rules-based order, and that is because um, it is not applied equally uh, to states in the world, and those perceptions of double standards of hypocrisy are acute right now. Um, we. I think we are going to go through a very rocky and volatile period. Uh, hopefully it will lean towards strengthening a rules-based order. Uh, no doubt that some of those institutions have to be reformed. Uh, there's a big conversation about UN Security Council reform and whether you know, the five states should, should, should have the veto power they do, whether it should be expanded, you know, how, how the rules should work on that because it has not been able to solve the conflicts, the ongoing conflicts that we have. Um, I think on the finance side, there's still a lot of potential to use those institutions that we have um, and development banks working together more. And I think Paris, the Paris Agreement has brought them together more. Um, there's been an attempt to look at what Paris alignment means. There's a long way to go. Um, but on that side, there, there is a need to, uh, to keep cooperating um, uh, between the Western focused ones and the Asian focused ones. You also have, um, yeah, new opportunities, I think, for North-South and South-South cooperation. Globally, we are seeing um, a shifting, a sort of what I called messy polarity recently, because we are seeing a shifting balance of power with quite a lot of middle powers um, exerting their influence, um, forming more transactional relationships, shall we see, mm. shall we say? And so countries in the Global South feel that they have um, some choice in who they go to for their financing, for their security, um, for their alliances, and are trying, um, many of them are trying to, to, to balance that out so that no you know, one country is, is, is too powerful uh, in terms of influence over them. And that's an interesting moment because with that choice, is coming uh, a stronger voice. And so I think international institutions have to take note of that. Um, and because that, that push will only, will only increase. Moving kind of back to the, kind of the, the core of, um, of the conversation about uh, kind of really kind of petro states and the kind of the future uh, for, for these nations that are uh, dependent upon oil and gas. Taking a very kind of European uh, perspective on things, um, we tend to see them as a monolith and without, without great, we just, it's, it's one block and uh, without any, any great uh, feelings of, of, of nuance between the, the particular uh, dynamics of the, the individual countries. Um, what does the West get right in that analysis and what does the West get entirely miss by, by losing that nuance? Well, the, there's many different positions in, within, uh, within the West. Uh, so if you're talking about climate mm -hmm. um, yes, exactly. experts and um, 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 and decision makers then. Uh, 
I'd say that in the past there was certainly a, yes, quite a, um, uh, quite a, a, a single, what should we say, a, mono, a monolithic view um, of, say, OPEC countries as, as countries that were holding back international um, targets and, and uh, actions and cooperation on, on climate mitigation. Um, and that's a feature of what their economic interests are. Uh, that has changed. Um, that has changed for a number of reasons. And you've really seen a massive shift in thinking, say, in the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council countries, Saudi and UAE and so on. I mean, there's been a big shift in the way that their governments have addressed um, uh, conversations about climate change and investment in um, mitigation uh, since around 2010 and it was initially um, their concerns about how much oil they were consuming and how much gas they were consuming at home and the constraints that were put on exports that uh, got those governments thinking about efficiency and renewable energy technology uh, which which helped to um, create a, a space, I think, for talking about new technologies. Obviously, these are countries that have very young populations, you know, around 60% of the population is under 30. So there's been a big shift in decision making in, in um, the technocratic um, elements of those, of those states too. So a lot has changed in the last, um, you know, two decades, but especially in the last decade. Um, we've seen massive investments in renewables. Um, so I think in, in terms of you know, what, what people working on climate think, there's a bit of a dualistic view at the moment. There's this, they see on the one hand, uh, the traditional patro-state action to hold on to their interests at any cost um, and actually continue to um, invest heavily in, in fossil fuels production, while at the same time, there's huge opportunity because of their revenues to invest um, in high capital uh, renewable energy and, um, and, and low carbon technologies, I mean, including um, carbon capture and storage, for instance, which the Gulf countries are very keen to um, show their, their prowess in. So, so there's that kind of duality of vision now. Um, yeah, what is often missed is the very real problems or challenges that those countries have in making the reforms necessary for economic diversification. So just globally, there's about 22 countries for whom oil and gas revenue make up over one fifth of government revenue. So the money the government is able to spend on the rest of the economy. Um, for the Gulf states, that's over mainly over 50%. For some countries like Iraq and Kuwait, it's over 90%. So if you try and imagine um, tackling that issue of even thinking about um, uh, phasing those out, it's a very, very difficult conversation to have that would in, entail huge reforms domestically. And those reforms would alter the social contract, which in some countries, the more authoritarian ones, you know, it's a sensitive thing to touch the social contract. So there have been efforts to reform subsidies, and you see that in the Gulf countries, um, needs to go much further to really um, galvanize new types of industry and new sectors because um, a system has grown up around very cheap um, inputs in terms of oil and gas. And um, just on that, uh, you were a part of the initial conversations on the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, yeah? So yeah. we uh, at Chatham House, we, we played a role in facilitating uh, some discussions amongst a group of governments in 2020 who were thinking about what phase out would mean and whether this were possible. Mm. So yeah, I think this is where, where things are at. And that, you know, that those initial conversations, I have to say that things really before 2020, um, the term phase out was not really on the agenda. And, it, and then it became, you know, a big 
point of contention at COP28, people calling for phase out, some saying phase down, and eventually you've got the transition away. Uh, but you just couldn't have had that conversation uh, mm. prior to, to that. As you mentioned, the reactions against uh, the crisis of climate change, <laughs> again, slightly challenging the kind of European US perspective on, on the kind of Middle East. Uh, we tend to see uh, the Middle East as uh, you know, causers of, uh, of global warming rather than victims of global warming. But actually, the reality on the ground is that you know the words kind of livability kind of creeps up quite often in the conversation, and that and that that particular part of the world will be is am, amongst the most climate vulnerable. Um, now, bearing in mind the diversity of the region and you know the, the various different um, you know, different countries have got you know different different uh, pressure points, uh, could you give an overview of the of the region on and its vulnerabilities uh, and how climate change is going to be impacting it? I mean, you're right, it's hugely diverse. So you have um, a country like Yemen suffering from conflict, mm. extreme poverty and climate change on top of that, um, very close to Qatar, which is a very high income um, per capita country with uh, immense uh, uh, resources to invest in infrastructure, for instance. So first of all, I just want to say there's a very, there's a huge difference in the ability, the capacity of countries to respond to environmental and, and climate threats. Um, those countries that have suffered and are suffering conflict are obviously in the worst position. Um, it, it, one of the, I mean, we, we did a study um, uh, in 2022 about climate risks in the region. And you'd probably be surprised to know that um, the biggest um, threat to life and damage is flooding. Mm. And that's because uh, you're seeing uh, uh, maybe less rain overall. So you are seeing drought, but you're seeing periods of flash floods and heavier rain and more intense storms as well in some of the coastal areas. And the infrastructure is not set up for that. So cities have been built in a way that doesn't factor in much drainage, uh, for instance. Um, planning regulations that say don't build on this wadi, which is the channel that takes the water out to the sea, have been uh, often ignored. And there's been a build-up of concrete in a very short space of time with a lot of rural to urban migration, uh, which then means that those roads, those cities are very vulnerable to flooding. And you saw that in Dubai recently. You've seen that um, even in the richer countries where flooding is a serious problem. Um, and for the poorer countries, it's an extreme problem because it also leads to um, greater levels of disease, like cholera, for instance, um, where sanitation facilities are, are destroyed and there's not much ability to respond to disasters. So that's something I wanted to, to point out straight away because people tend to think of drought. Now drought is a problem. Uh, it's going to have um, more and more severe effects on the rural communities, the farming communities, which we don't really think of. Again, I think a lot of people do think of the Middle East um, as, as a sort of desert, but there's lots of green areas. And Iraq, for instance, used to be the breadbasket of the region um, with its two rivers. Now those rivers are extremely stressed because of the damming upstream and you've had um, uh, pollution and poor management of water and then conflict on top of that over many years. And sometimes, you know, farmers are asked like over the last couple of years to stop producing rice, especially when a Turkish dam was being filled. Um, a few years ago, um, so see so the but the way that crops are produced again um, is fairly water intensive, and that will need to change as well because food will become increasingly you know locally produced food will become increasingly important. Coming back to the oil question as well, a lot of the countries that depend on oil revenues, one of the huge um, challenges of thinking about a post oil economy or at least you know, much lower revenues coming from that, um, those exports, is how they will pay for food imports. Because uh, most of the countries in the Middle East are highly dependent on uh, imports of food. And as we saw with the, uh, the grain crisis in, in 2010, that can, that can lead to food price spikes, which then cause instability. So food security is, is another big issue for the region.
um, I think what, what we're leaning towards here is the, the links between kind of geopolitics and the environments and conflict. So taking, for example, uh, water, like as a kind of core resource, you know, fundamental for, for human life, and the, the impact it's having on conflicts within the Middle East. Uh, so, for example, like the, the Syrian civil war, the Golan Heights. Um, should we be talking about conflict in a different way and p taking in this, this really important factor of like, you know, the, the fundamental building block of life, which is water? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this does need much greater attention. Mm -hmm. If you look at, I've, we've mentioned the shared rivers, you know, between Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, for instance, this is a shared resource that is extremely valuable. It's, it's, it's essentially more valuable than oil, although it's not mm. thought of that way because of the market price of oil. Just because water isn't priced, you know, um, it doesn't factor into, into GDP um, and it's never seen as a good investment. And so the ecosystems around that river have not received investment, they've not received care and we are really seeing and you know the excessive damming has has led to extreme water shortages um, in the south of Iraq particularly. So when in 2018 you had the mass water poisonings in Basra, I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw that, but over 100,000, maybe 118,000 people were hospitalized because the water coming out of their taps was really saline and probably polluted. Um, that then caused um, outbreaks of, of violence and then violent repression and really paved the way for a, a much bigger a sort of revolutionary action in 2019. Um, environment is, is so acutely felt, you know, when, the, when those environmental services that should be provided to all are not available, it draws attention to many other problems in the economy. Um, the lack of jobs, the frustrations people have over, you know, lack of electricity, when, especially when they are living in an area that is essentially very rich in oil reserves. So you have those compounds that will be living very nicely and generating a lot of revenue for the economy. But clearly that was not being reinvested um, in, in the water. And that came as a result of a mixture of problems, you know, not just climate, it was probably chiefly mismanagement, corruption, damming and, and so on that had led to, um, uh, to, to the poisoning. But I just used that example um, to say that this is an issue of political stability that can then cause conflict. It can also spill across borders. If countries blame the country next door for the water shortage, and you've seen that between Iran and Afghanistan lately. And yet these rivers or these or shared aquifers, they represent a really important um, opportunity for collaboration too. And they're generally in the world, you know, there's probably been a greater amount of cooperation over water than there has been um, a, a conflict. So I'm very um, reluctant to talk about water wars as such. Um, it shouldn't be seen as a zero sum game. Um, and yet, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have to value this resource much, much better than we currently do. And also understand, let's come on to, you know, how uh, resources, say, in the Middle East and Africa, um, Latin America, you know, how do they relate to us in Europe? Mm. We buy a lot of products that affect water. So whether that's oil, um, which, you know, often has, you know, often has pollutive effects on local lakes and rivers, um, which sometimes needs a lot of water in the uh, process of, of extraction, um, uh, or whether we're talking about food, which has uses irrigation um, uh, and which may also cause pollution in rivers of, of pol various pollutants. So we are active participants in um, uh, creating water scarcity in many countries. Um, we uh, we currently work on a project around promoting fair water footprints and a study was done as part of that that showed that 50% uh, of the water used to produce goods that we import into, into Europe um, comes from moderately to severely scarce uh, countries, you know, water, water scarce countries. So that in itself is, is a big problem. And I think when you're talking, you know, coming back to your conflict question, there is a huge question about doing no harm, you know, because we know that water scarcity does lead to competition and sometimes conflict. And so 
how can trading practices, uh, production patterns and consumption patterns um, at least do no harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you say, uh, climate doesn't respect borders. And also you say that um, the European Union is impacted by what happens in in the Middle East. Uh, could you kind of dig, dig a little bit more into that? Um, I know you've been, uh, you, your work with the EU uh, Cascades does kind of show some of the, the linkages, um, but could you could you kind of pull, pull that out for us and say like what the impact of a climate, genuine uh, climate crisis in the Middle East, What how would that impact um, us in Europe? So Europe's right next door, we're intertwined with the Middle East in various ways. Um, it's always been of strategic interest and security interest, of course. Europe uh, at the EU level is, has been increasingly concerned about migration since uh, the outbreak of, 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 of war since 2011 in particular. And, um, and then there is, there is trade and there is investment which are all affected uh, by climate impacts. So, so there should be a very strong interest in building resilience in the region. So there are some great EU programmes, for example, um, and some UK programmes to, uh, to, to fund and to promote uh, climate resilience plans and projects. But as we've mentioned, you know, there is conflict in the region there is also there are also conflicting economic interests. Um, I think it's not going to be effective to finance, you know, this project or that project if you don't look at some of the bigger issues. If you don't tackle some of the big um, diplomatic issues, and you know, Israel Palestine being um, a big one, but there are there are there are certainly others. And that's something that, you know, if you don't solve those problems, then all your efforts at, say, building nice water treatment plants or mm. uh, solar panels uh, will be worthless, you know, as we have seen with recent destruction in Gaza. Yeah, and um, what's your view on the, the Fortress Europe initiative where they're... You mean trying to keep migrants out? Exactly. I think it's problematic. I really do. I don't think you can stop people from migrating when the conditions are so bad, you know, often driven by conflict, but also driven by uh, other forms of insecurity. We are going to see migration, attempts at migration continue. And I think that's a reality of our world that we have to deal with a bit better. There's no easy answer to this. Um, you know, one thing is, is continuing to work on governance and resilience in the regions of origin to uh, to improve things in a genuine way for the long term, not just papering over the cracks because that won't work. Um, of course, acting on climate change mitigation as urgently as possible because for every fraction of a degree of global warming we have, we will have more um, extreme temperatures in areas that are already extremely arid. And that will cause, you know, mainly rural to urban migration, but then of course the, the pressure on municipalities, cities can become great. It can cause uh, tensions and people can feel more incentivized to, uh, to migrate. You know, the kind of selective attitude that some European countries have taken towards migration is also not helpful because it's encouraged a brain drain from certain countries. That might be a controversial thing to say in places, but I've heard that criticism levied quite a lot. And, uh, and the fact is, you know, in a country like the UK, we're not the worst hit by migration. This is, uh, you know, this is an issue that really affects Greece, Spain, Italy. Um, and we need to look at transit centers and how to, you know, I was, I was, I was in Greece in 2016 um, and we had a, a workshop there about how to improve conditions for the refugees and the stories were horrific. Mm. Um, and I, I remember, a, you know, a senior person who, from one of the NGOs that had been working in the camps, you know, just making this really clear point these you know this is this is europe's problem that europe has not managed uh 
to apportion responsibility for the refugees adequately. So they're all stuck here in these, these, these tiny kind of prison camps, really. So uh, we need to deal with it in a sensible way, pragmatic way, have dialogue about actually actual migration rather than just, uh, as you say, putting up the fortress. Um, but at the same time, look into those, how do you, again, do no harm in increasing the inequalities, um, oppression, you know, the human rights issues that cause um, migration in the first place. And another theme that's, that has been kind of, I think, bubbling under the surface of everything we, we've talked about is uh, kind of the interconnectedness of, of everything. You know, there's, it's very hard to talk about one, one issue without, uh, without it overlapping with five or six others. Um, and one um, topic that you, that you've, you've, you've talked about in, in the past uh, is the kind of the food, energy, water nexus. How does that type of nexus thinking allow us to better understand geopolitics? Wow. Okay, that is an interconnected question uh, <laughs> in itself. So. Um, let's talk about water from a water from a water perspective, and I want to go back to this idea that. Um, we're very connected through water because water is used to produce energy um, in, in agriculture and the food that we import. Um, there's inputs in terms of the irrigation, um, but there's also pollutants that run off into the rivers from fertilizer, from pesticides that then have an effect downstream. Um, the desalination, the rate of desalination in the Gulf is huge now. Um, it's uh, that dependence on using seawater um, for drinking and for, uh, well, for, for irrigation, for, uh, for, for everything, um, will increasingly come from um, desalinated water in the region. Um, that takes energy to produce, and that's often been gas, uh, sometimes oil, to power those stations. You can do it with solar, and they're doing a bit more of that, but it's still a small, small proportion. Um, so these are the ways that energy, water, food, some of the ways in which they're interconnected. And of course, some of that stuff is traded. So some of the things that water goes into, um, the products, the embedded water, we call it, or the virtual water, um, is in the products that we import in Europe, in the US, um, and, and, uh, and the rest of the world. So that does pose some really serious questions for, um, our role in potentially worsening water scarcity. So again, there's the, the geopolitical lenses that we're, at, we're in an interconnected world and need to think about sensitive issues because countries generally want to export more of their products. But if they're producing them in a very water intensive way, that is also maybe diverting. It's not just about the amount of water used because maybe water is plentiful, um, but it's, whether that allocation is fair, whether it pollutes the water, also whether the actual um, operation itself is degrading the land, for instance, and making uh, climate resilience more difficult. Uh, is, it, is it helping or hindering with flood resilience, for instance? There's a huge amount of issues around those productive sectors. So I've just chosen one example, but that's one way of looking at how this really is a cross-border um, into interconnected issue that has many sides to it. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of something I was working on a couple of years ago, and, and we didn't publish it because facts on the ground were changing so fast, but we were looking, as part of the Cascades project, the Cascading Climate Risk Project, we were looking at uh, the Jordan Valley, which is shared between Jordan, Israel, and Palestinian territories as, a, um, as an example of a shared environment that was under threat from climate, uh, climate change, uh, but it was also uh, driven by conflict. Um, so co cooperation to restore ecosystems, to create um, climate resilience was extremely hindered by the conditions there. And, uh, you know, you can't do that research without coming to the conclusion that there is little point in doing nice climate resilience projects without addressing the bigger political problems. You know, for most farmers in the West, Palestinian West Bank, for example, um, 
the, their attempt at even owning a livelihood, never mind climate resilience, is extremely inhibited by the occupation and the various activities that, say, siphon away water or uh, bulldoze in uh, systems to collect rainwater, for instance, or destroy olive groves. Um, this is a daily reality for those people. So it's you can have investments in nice wastewater treatment plants and in, uh, um, in climate resilient agriculture, for instance, but they are not going to be sustainable if you don't deal with those political realities. So I just want to use that as an example where um, I felt that was a region where the EU was very keen to invest and you have US initiatives there and, and you have had for many years. But when you do look at the realities in the ground and the way that it's polit been politically fragmented, um, the political realities work against climate resilience, simple as that. Um, and when it comes to water as well, there is a trade element to that as well because goods that are produced um, using a lot of water are exported to, uh, to the EU, to the UK. And uh, that raises a very serious question about whether that water allocation was fair and whether it was, um, whether the trade of that, those products was exacerbating um, uh, the conflict problem in the first place or the inequalities that caused that. Hmm. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But just to wrap up, could I ask, uh, we always ask for one piece of advice at the end. And um, in this case, I would like you to uh, to kind of give your view on, uh, to, for the viewers out there who are interested in watching the development and evolution of the region, uh, what one reframe, if it's possible to take it down to one reframe, um, do you think that we should make, which will increase our understanding of the evolution of the, the Middle East region over the next kind of 20 odd years? It's hard to do it in one, but I'd say try to understand the history and the history of how things came to be where they are, whether that's where borders were drawn or allocations of power. That, you know, when you go to the Middle East, you'll find that people have very long memories compared to us. We have very short, short memories, but they will be talking, you know, they might be talking 500 years back uh, before you know it. Um, and, and, and so understanding a bit of the history and how people's identities were formed is, is important. Um, understand that those identities are shifting, um, uh, again, as we've mentioned, with the very young um, uh, population that, that, that um, is, is living and working there. And I guess, finally, just, uh, I'd say this for any region in the world, there is no better way to get to know a people and what's important to them than just listening, you know, and, and when you go to places, don't just engage with the experts in your field, which we're often pushed to do because it's a short time, we're in a conference, um, you know, get out and talk to the taxi drivers, the shopkeepers, the farmers, the, um, you know, a wider range of people because you'll often find insights there that you wouldn't otherwise have got um, that might take you in a different direction, but will also gain your work a bit more credibility um, I think, mm -hmm. because, uh, yes, it will give you a more rounded picture. Brilliant. Okay, super advice. Thank you so much. It's been, been a real pleasure, real honour. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you very much for joining us on that conversation. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you uh, learned something. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and to subscribe to any of our channels and we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.